I'm John Padwick. Uh, Matt Nager, we're both from Merkel. I run the travel practice. Uh, Matt runs our digital planning group. What we're going to talk to you about is using customer information to deliver a better experience. I'm going to walk you through kind of customer information that we know of today and usage patterns and a little bit of work we did with Focusrite. And Matt's going to talk about how he's seeing it, he's leveraging it within the planning process. So looking at customer travel experience, today we wanted to look at it purely from its customer standpoint. You know, when Molly gets an idea to take a vacation, what, what does that process look like? What's her consumption patterns? And where is the potential to influence? So we, everybody's seen this journey slide. I'll just walk quickly through it and talk about some of the observations I see. You know, from idea, there's sometimes offline validation. Hey, is this a good idea, a vacation, and where, when should we go? You know, using Google, you narrow it down, maybe get to beaches in this example. Decide on Aruba. Then validate with critic sites, you know, all about Aruba. Look on OTAs, and then you purchase. So Molly purchases, uses social media to tout out about her experience. Again, maybe uses an offline validation like travel and leisure to validate that she's made the right decision. Then you're seeing things like um, you know, mobile apps um, and, and uh, tablet usage, as well as experience on, when they're actually on the stay, posting photographs about their experience, and then when they come back, potentially a TripAdvisor review. So everybody, like I said, has seen this. I think, for me, the most interesting recent learnings on this are the number of activities that come post-purchase. Okay, from uh, my background as a, as a former hotel marketer, you know, this, this post-purchase activity, which is digital, really weighs into your guest experience now. Uh, you know, a lot of that stuff didn't occur before. That's uh, one of the first things I noticed about this. <clears throat> the second thing is the mindset that occurs along the path, right? You know, initially when she's validating that she wants to take a trip, that's a different thought process than when she's, you know, looking on OTAs. Yet, if I look in the travel industry, all, all the ads along this whole process will say 199 Aruba from start to finish, right? So we don't vary the messaging across. Um, and then the final thing we see, which we talked about yesterday, is multi-device, okay? You know, you see that with the, uh, the Marriott app, for example, um, tablet usage. And with that, so with that, we actually went to Focusrite and, and partnered with them on a study called um, Search Shop Buy, the new digital funnel. Um, I'll share a couple key observations for you here. We looked at the digital planning process across this spectrum. Dream, search, shop, buy, experience, and share. I'm going to share a couple key learnings I think came from that study, then I'll hand it over to Matt. The first thing we see is there's a definite online travel planning curve. Okay, we, I think you heard it alluded to a little bit yesterday, but there's much, as, as, as illustrated in our journey map, it's used pretty extensively at the destination and shopping stage. Sometimes the, the, the early stage, it's not used as much, but there's a definite fall off in booking. And then it picks back up again sharing. Okay? If we drill down on this, because remember, this is all digital, and we look at it only on a mobile basis, the curve gets much worse. And so what you're actually seeing here is across different countries, when people use mobile at what stage. So you know, clearly they use it at destination stage, shopping, way fall off and buy, right? Um, particularly low in Germany, France, and UK, and then picks back up. I think the interesting points here are China's, China's much more comfortable buying, um, and then you'll see the sharing is pretty much across the board jumping up. But I'm going to hand it over to Matt now, who's going to talk how do you use this data, how do you use these consumption patterns across the different phases to really target your marketing. So, yeah, as, as John said, you know, obviously this journey is evolving and developing. And I think you've heard a number of things over the last day and a half or so here about, you know, the personalization piece that we just went through, which I think is great. And the analytic focus on personalization is fabulous. Where we tend to see a drop off in this process is people not really planning from an audience and customer perspective and a customer view. So as you look at something like this slide, and you start talking about how do I deal with messaging where I want to move somebody through a relationship. You know, to John's point, every offer, every ad, every delivery shouldn't be a discount, shouldn't be a room rate, shouldn't be a property, you know, value point. It should be a conversation with a customer and where a lot of the focus is, that's starting to move in the digital space now, um, from our perspective, is connecting that experience so that you can, whether it's cross device eventually or whether it's just simply add to add delivery, move through a messaging plan. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get to that. The key point of this slide, though, is that 
you can do the same thing on the unidentified segment side and eventually connect that into an identified segment and that's, that's really where we want to keep our focus. In order to be able to do this though, we've identified a series of what we call competencies of, of platform marketing. And this is this idea that you've now got this series of technology platforms and marketing technology stacks and different component parts that come together. But you've got to have competencies in different areas to take advantage of that. So as you've talked about personalization the last two days, we talked about SEO in the first session yesterday, and as an old search person in that space, I, I, I was really kind of interested in, in seeing where that conversation has evolved on the content side. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't have competencies in the organization to take a look at the data side of that equation, you know, the things that we just talked about, about what that platform data looks like, managing identity, managing consumer privacy, dealing with the enablers of that data then, so platforms that you're gonna utilize the data on, the ability to measure and build attribution, so we're not just looking at last stage funnel acquisition, we're looking at the entire funnel and how it interacts together, how the messages are playing through that funnel. Uh, and then the, the, the ability to use that information to execute. So in the last session you just heard a lot about how, how you can execute personalization into a process but you also have to think about personalization as a media optimization process. So if you're gonna be able to personalize the experience, how are you gonna change your media buying process? Is your media buyer gonna know, based upon what we're likely to see in a conversion rate based on increased personalization, there's a different point of time to deliver the ad and how does that process come into play? We, we see this view through what we, we refer to as a marketing technology stack, but really I, I think I would point out two different aspects of this slide. The first of which is, Everybody starts at either the top or the bottom. So you've got groups of people that start with the audience platform, the people responsible for running your advertising on Facebook, running your advertising on Google, running your advertising inside of Baidu if you're in an international marketplace like China. And you know those people are on one side of the spectrum and then you've got the people that sit on the bottom side of that spectrum in this bottom row, the database marketing group and the people that have the CRM system, that have the customer data, that have the understanding of what customers really want, what they're doing with you, and how they're connecting those pieces together on their side. And the big issue that everybody tries to deal with is, how do you get in between here? How do you deal with all the component parts in the middle? And I think, you know, the, the important one that come, came out of a conversation yesterday was this aspect of identity management. So as you look at the identity of an individual, identity management in the offline world has always been about householding. And in today's world, it's all about device, user ID, account location, mapping all that across so that every time you serve an ad, you have an idea of who that person is. And then you have the ability to push that up through the tech stack. Now the challenge is, most of the time you look at a picture like this, and there are literally thousands of images that could be on this slide, but we've narrowed it into a few just to use the example. Hey, what I want to express to everybody today is that it doesn't matter who you pick in which of these blocks. You know, everybody's got some component part in every one of these blocks, whether it be a DMP that you're using to add third-party data in, a decision management and optimization platform as a buying platform, a media execution platform, a channel execution platform. So having all these component parts really doesn't do you any good if you don't have a way to connect all those parts together for one seamless planning process and one experience. And I think as you start to bring that experience in, there's a question of what it starts to change. And, and everybody's got their version of a funnel. This is, this is a rather mundane version of what a funnel looks like. But if you look at it, it's, it's pretty consistent to what we've talked about. At the top of the funnel, you don't know anything about anybody. You send out advertising in the awareness and consideration phase to, to what are listed as unknown individuals. As you work your way down, then you get into that remarketing stage, which pretty much every form of database marketing or direct marketing over the years actually falls into that criteria of remarketing. It's the idea that you've seen somebody, you know them and you've done something with them so now you're gonna have a conversation with them. And then in the end, you get to people that fall out at the bottom, so the conversion side of that equation. And see, at the bottom of there, you've got some high value people, you've got some low value people, you've got some people you still really don't know anything about, you just know that they bought. And that they're, they're gonna be coming in go into your property or they're gonna be flying on your airline, or they're gonna be experiencing your destination. You can start to use those people to find other people that look a lot like them. Other people that have the same characteristics, the same profiles, the same conversation types, the same values to you as an organization. What's really started to come out of this data though 
is that we've seen a, a pretty significant increase over the last, I would say, 18 months on the ability to re-identify somebody after they've come through this process. So a 400% increase in identified targeting at the top of the funnel really starts to change how you see those people working their way through the funnel in the conversation. The back end of that then is obviously, you know, this explosion of creative that comes out. And we just went through a session earlier today about how data feeds creative development. You need a planning process for that. You can look at these different component parts, start to understand how that data explodes out into actual delivery. I found it interesting yesterday uh, when the gentleman from Orbitz was talking about building value-based data as, or value-based content as opposed to just production-level content. You start to think about that. The data and the analytics, you actually need both. You need the value base, but you need the data to tell you which of those component parts is the most valuable, which content you want to build, and then how you want to deliver that content on the other side. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, though, you still need that production level content. So even though we may not want to highlight 5 million pages that are all destination pages, you still got to have those pages because somebody's eventually going to get there. And whether you're building them for SEO, you're building them for delivery, or just purely building them so that every property has a presence on the website, certainly something that you want to think about and still have a process to be able to build. In order to be able to rationalize all that, though, you've, you've got to have a planning process. And in our view, that planning process has to start with the audience. So it starts with what is the value proposition to the audience? What is the proposition of what we want to talk to them about? How do we want to engage them there? How do we want to deliver that content that we're going to build out in the long run? And how do we know where that content needs to be built from and what perspective and voice and delivery mechanism it needs to be built from? That then moves into what we, what we call a customer experience blueprint. You can call it really whatever you want, but it's the idea of starting to map out all the different delivery points, interaction points, trigger points that occur across that customer journey. So that map that John showed in the beginning, and as we look at an audience and we say, we know that in the past they have done these 18 things to get to booking. How do we then bleed that back into a process where we know where those 18 things are? We start to measure and experience those points differently and we start to understand how each of those points influences the actual outcome at the end. Fact of the matter is there's millions of journeys, millions of decision points, millions of delivery points that you could focus in on. The blueprint gives you the ability to understand where you're going to be most influential in that interaction point. The third stage then deals with communication architecture and a traditional planning mechanism being able to say, okay, what's our core value? What's our secondary value? How do we bleed that into sequential messaging? And then how do we get that into the final stage, which is the message sequence plan that we start to test against point one as a value proposition versus point two versus point three versus point four. Every audience will see each of those points differently. Every audience will want those points differently in their message sequence. So you've got to have that all focused back at the, at the audience side to begin with. In order to do that, we really, we, you know, in our view, you've got a planning process that takes into account everything in the insight stage on, you know, at the beginning where you've got stakeholder interviews, you've got customer interviews, you start to know the objectives and the infrastructure necessary to be able to execute your programs. You look at your audience profiles. You start to know what are my best customers doing when they're here? What are they doing before they book? What are they doing after they leave? You start to look at you know, illustrating those personas out so that you can start to identify and kind of bleed up an image to the, to the process. Work through what everybody else in your space is doing with those people. So how does my message look different than somebody else's message? The point that John made earlier about if everybody gives a 199 offer at every stage of the process, well then everybody's got the same offer. So this is where you need to understand and think through, am I really gonna go after this customer? Do I have a right to win? Is my right to win better than somebody else's? And if it isn't, how do I start to address that in my marketing message? That then bleeds into your strategy. So you look at your experience map, you look at your customer journey definitions of what you're trying to achieve and where you're trying to achieve it. You look at your positioning. Do we want to be first in the conversation? Do we want to be third in the conversation? Do we want to be last in the conversation based upon the value of the audience that we're talking to? And then you look at how are you going to go after these people? Where is the targeting come from? What level of personalization is this, this audience worth on the investment side based upon what life cycle they're in with you and your, your 
brand, how do you want to go ahead and evaluate that conversation? And then you get into the briefing and planning process, and then finally the development, launch, and optimization, which all the analytics people tell me is the most important part, but that's only because they're the analytics people. You've got to have a map of what that marketing technology stack is. You've got to know where those component parts are from that slide that we showed earlier. You've got to know who the players are. Chances are it's going to be in different parts of your organization. It's going to bleed across different areas of your business. It's going to bleed into to new component parts that you have to go out, identify, and buy. In the, in the next piece, then, once you've got the stack identified, you can start to identify the wave. You can start to identify the process and the plan. You've got to have the way to personalize the creative, both from a scale perspective, but also personalizing the experience journey based upon the interactions and the things that your customer's telling you along the way. So the why of what the question is that they're asking you as opposed to just the what. And then the last thing is really taking a look at that <coughs> message sequence plan. You know, how do we have a conversation with somebody that hasn't made a choice yet versus a conversation with somebody that's made a choice and is just trying to narrow in on their decision to buy versus somebody that's already bought, is about to come to your property, is about to experience your destination, is about to you know, fly your airline. What kind of conversation do we have there? You know, do we send emails? Do we send that out via display? Do we use search on that platform? And then finally, once they've come, how are you engaging them while they're on property? A lot of conversation yesterday about engaging people while they're in the middle of their experience from a social perspective, but I would also say that you can do the same thing for upsell capability, for conversations about local events, for information that you're providing, whether that be through an app, whether that be through ad creative delivery. Those people, even though they're on property, are still out on the web, still looking at information, still reading email, still searching for things. Maybe they're using an open table to book reservation somewhere. How are you using that data to kind of come back and, and enhance their experience on site? And then finally, after they leave, what are you doing to get them to actually tell everybody else what a great time they had? So all the benefits, all the negatives. You know, we had the conversation about the, um, the castle, and I think it was Scotland yesterday. You know, nobody cares about the octagonal dining room area that he was talking about. I get that. But... There are a lot of people that have been there that have identified the property values that are important to them. How do you get that conversation back out into the mainstream? How do you engage them in the dialogue? And how do you continue to push that dialogue forward after they've left? So with that, we will close up. Thank you very much.